Let me uh, just begin by taking a moment uh, to kind of summarize for the American people uh, where we are at in this enormous discussion, which is causing a great deal of anxiety all over Vermont and all over America. And that is several months ago, uh, the Republican-led House passed by, I believe, three votes uh, legislation that would throw 23 million Americans off of the health insurance they currently have. 23 million Americans, men, women, and children, people who are struggling with cancer, with heart disease, with diabetes, with other life-threatening illnesses. They were simply thrown off of the health insurance that they have. That legislation also cut Medicaid by $800 billion over a 10-year period. And that means that children with disabilities in Alaska or Vermont who are now on Medicaid might no longer be able to get the help that they need in order to survive or to live a dignified life at a time when Medicaid provides two-thirds of the funding for nursing homes all over this country, it means that if the Republican legislation were to succeed, we don't know, but thousands and thousands of people all over this country with Alzheimer's, with terrible illnesses who are now in nursing homes would be thrown out of their nursing homes. Where would they go? Nobody really knows. But when you cut Medicaid by $800 billion and Medicaid funds two-thirds of nursing home cares, care, needless to say, nursing home people would be forced, people in nursing homes would be forced to leave, to go nobody knows where. Right now, in my state of Vermont and across this country, we are dealing with a massive heroin and opioid crisis. Every day, people are dying from heroin, opioid overdoses. Turns out that Medicaid is the major source of funding in terms of treating heroin and opioid addiction. If you make massive cuts to Medicaid, the impact in states like Vermont, West Virginia, Kentucky, states that are struggling with opioid and heroin addiction, the impact would be horrendous. People would no longer be able to get the treatment that they need. Mr. President, I recall that during the campaign, Donald Trump said he was a champion of working families he was going to stand up for workers, take on the establishment. If the Republican House bill were to be passed, older workers, people who are 60, 62 years of age, would see in many cases at least a doubling of the premiums that they pay. In many cases go from $4,000 a year today to over $8,000 a year. That is not being a champion or a friend of the working class. My Republican friends, and you hear them even today, talk about freedom, choice. They love choice. They love freedom. People in America should have the right to get health care any place they want. Should be a right to have any insurance policy they want. Two and a half million women have made a choice, Mr. President. And the choice they made is they want to get quality health care through Planned Parenthood. If the Republican bill in the House were to pass, those two and a half million women would be denied their choice. So you got a Republican bill in the House, throws 23 million people off of health insurance. How many of those people will die? My Republican friends get very nervous when I raise that issue, because they say, and I understand, that nobody here wants to see anybody unnecessarily die. No Republican does, no Democrat, no American does. 
But according to study after study after study, including studies done at the Harvard School of Public Health, when you throw 23 million people off of health insurance, people with cancer, people with heart disease, people with diabetes, people with life-threatening illnesses, what do you think will happen? And what these studies show is that thousands and thousands of Americans every year will die unnecessarily because they will not have the treatment that they need to deal with their life-threatening illnesses. That is the reality. That's not Bernie Sanders talking. That is study after study after study. PolitiFact backed that up. They looked at all of the studies and they said, yeah, thousands of people will die. That's the result. Now, in the House bill, after you throw 23 million people off of health insurance, raise deductibles, defund Planned Parenthood, if you make older people pay more for health care, $800 billion in cuts to Medicaid, what else is in the bill? Oh, oh, there are some people who will do well in the bill, not the children, not the elderly, not the sick, not the poor, but there are some people, and we have to acknowledge that, who will do well in the Republican bill. And that is if you are in the top 1%, congratulations. Republican legislation after throwing children, disabled children, off of health care. Congratulations. You're going to get a massive tax break. Who in America believes that it makes sense to throw disabled children off of health insurance, tell people with cancer they can't continue to get the treatment they need in order to get $300 billion in tax breaks to the top 1% and hundreds of billions more in tax breaks to insurance companies and drug companies. Well, you know what? My Republican colleagues may think that that is a good idea. That is not what the American people believe. Latest poll that I saw, the USA Today poll, had 12% of the American people thinking that was a good idea. And I can only believe that those 12% had not really looked at this issue. Massive opposition from Republicans, Democrats, independents, to this absurd Republican proposal. But it's not just the American people, Mr. President, who think that it is absurd to give tax breaks to the rich and throw 23 million people, million Americans off their health insurance. Not just the American people, it is those people who are most engaged in health care in America, the people who know the most. And it is important to understand that throughout this process, whether in the House, in the Senate, virtually every major health care organization in America, the people who treat us every single day, are opposed to this Republican legislation. One might think that maybe my Republican colleagues would say, well, wait a second, what's going on when the American Medical Association those are our doctors, the people who treat us. They think this legislation is a mistake. Doctors say no. The American Hospital Association, they say no because they understand that when you make massive cuts to Medicaid, rural hospitals in Vermont and all over this country may go under. And then what happens to a rural community that no longer has its hospital? American Hospital Association opposed to this legislation. The American Cancer Society opposed to this legislation. They know what its impact will be with folks who are struggling with cancer. The American Heart Association, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, Federation of American Hospitals, the Catholic Health Association, American Lung Association, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, March of Dimes, the National MS Society, and the American Nurses Association. One might think that when virtually every major national health care organization in this country is opposed to legislation, that maybe, just maybe, my Republican colleagues might think twice about going forward. But they have not had in this process the opportunity, amazingly enough, to hear from doctors 
to hear from hospital administration, to hear from patient advocates, because, Mr. President, as you well know, despite the fact that we are dealing with an issue that impacts every single American, which is what healthcare does, an issue that impacts one-sixth of the American economy, over three trillion dollars a year, there has not been one hearing, one public hearing on this bill. This bill has been written behind closed doors. Anyone listening to Senator McCain the other day made that point. Now, how do you deal with one-sixth of the economy and their desire to transform the American health care system without listening to one doctor, without listening to one hospital administration, writing a bill with a few Republican senators behind closed doors. This is an unprecedented and disastrous process for health care. And just on those grounds alone, what every member of this Senate should agree to, and Senator McCain made this point, this process has been awful, kill it now, go back to what is called regular process here, regular order, go back to the committee, start this discussion. Please do not throw 22, 23 million people off of health insurance without hearing from doctors, patient advocates, hospital administrators. But no, that is not where the Republicans are at today. They want to rush this thing through, behind closed doors and get a quick vote on this. Now, interestingly enough, Mr. President, as I understand it, a Senator Daines of Montana today is going to introduce legislation for a Medicare for all health care system. That's very interesting. And I, I hope, I hope that this is really a breakthrough on the part of my Republican colleagues. I hope very much that finally they recognize that maybe the United States of America should join every other major country on earth in guaranteeing health care to all people as a right and not a privilege. And I hope that when Senator Daines comes down here, he will say that no, it does not make sense to throw 23 million more people off of health care, but in fact we have to move forward, do what Canada does, what Germany does, what UK does, what France does, what every major country on earth does, and guarantee health care to all people as right. I hope very much that that is what Senator Danes will be saying. But you know what, Mr. President, I kind of think that that is not what he will be saying. I kind of think that in the midst of this discussion, in which millions of Americans are wondering whether or not they're going to continue to have health care, what's going to happen to their kids, what's going to happen to their parents. I suspect that what Senator Daines is doing is nothing more than an old political trick trying to embarrass Democrats. Will they support the Medicare for All bill introduced by Congressman John Conyers? And at a time when we are engaged in a very serious debate about the future of health care, I think this is not a time for political gains. Now, Senator Daines is serious about a Medicare for all proposal. Let us work together. But now is not the time for political gains. Senator Daines, as I understand it, is going to offer an amendment but we don't know what he is amending because we don't even know what is in the legislation that the Republicans will bring forward. How do you amend something when we don't even have a base bill to amend? So this is, I suspect, hope I'm wrong. I hope Senator Daines has seen light, but I suspect not. And I suspect it's just a political game. But I do hope, by the way, at some point, within this debate, if we can, if not certainly in the near future, to in fact be introducing a Medicare for all single payer program. It will be somewhat different than my friend John Conyers' bill in the House. But what it will do is say that in America, if you are rich or if you are poor, 
If you are a man, woman, and child, yes, you are entitled to health care as a human right and not a privilege. Mr. President, as you may or may not know, our current health care system is the most expensive, bureaucratic, and wasteful system in the entire world. And while the health care industry makes hundreds of billions of dollars a year in profits, and in many ways, what our health care system is about is not providing quality care to all of us, but to seeing how the insurance companies and the drug companies can rip us off, the truth is that even today, we have some 28 million people who have no health insurance. So our goal should be to say to those 28 million, we are going to provide health insurance to you, to all Americans, not to throw 22, 23 million more people off of health insurance. Mr. President, all of us recognize that the Affordable Care Act is far, far from perfect. And what the American people want us to do, to do and poll after poll suggest this, is they want us to improve the affordable, the affordable Care Act, not destroy it. The American people are paying deductibles that in many instances are far too high, keeping people from going to the doctor when they need to. Today, co-payments much too high, premiums much too high. And I do find it interesting, Mr. President, that when Donald Trump campaigned for president, he talked about the high cost of prescription drugs. Well, he's right. In this country, and I'm going to get into that in a moment, we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. That is what the American people want us to deal with in health care legislation, not throw 22 million people off of health care. They want us to lower the cost of prescription drugs. But I have not heard one word from the Republicans about the need to lower the cost of prescription drugs. Mr. President, the United States spends far, far more per capita on health care than any major country on earth, earth. And we often have worse outcomes. Now, the first, if we go back to regular order, if we go back to the committee process, which is what we should, the very first question that a member of the Senate should ask is, how does it happen that here in America we spend far, far more per capita on health care than do the people of any other country. And here's the chart. Here's the chart. The United States now, we are spending $9,990 per person on health care. Almost $10,000 per person on health care. What do they spend in Germany? Well, they spend $5,300. Almost half of what we spend. What about Canada? I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. It's a really nice country. They spend $4,533. So how does it happen that we are spending more than double per person compared to the Canadians and almost double what the Germans do? French spend less than half of what we do. Australians spend less than half of what we do. Japanese spend less than half. In the UK, they spend about 40 percent. Don't you think, Mr. President, that the very first question that a member of the Senate might ask, why do we spend so much compared to other countries? And by the way, all of these other countries guarantee health care to all of their people. And in many instances, the outcomes, the health outcomes in those countries is better than our country. They live longer. The life expectancy is longer. Their infant mortality rate is lower. And in some particular diseases, they do better in treating their people. Mr. President, here is a simple truth. 
And the truth is that if we took a hard look at countries around the world, all of which have in one form or another national health care programs, all of which said that health care is a right whether you're rich or you're poor, maybe we might want to learn something. But no, no. We have not had one hearing in order to discuss why we spend twice as much per capita on health care and why we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. You know why we haven't had any hearings on that, fellow Americans? Because it might get the insurance companies a little bit nervous. Insurance companies pour hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in campaign contributions into the political process. Pharmaceutical industry spends a huge amount of money on campaign contributions and lobbying efforts. So I say to my colleagues in the Senate, maybe, just maybe, we might want to stand up for working people and the middle class rather than for the owners of the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry. Now, it's interesting. You know, one never knows what to expect from the president. Every given day, there is another adventure out there. But a couple of months ago, the president met with, I believe, the Australian prime minister. And that was in May. And the president, President Trump, said uh, that during that meeting, he said, Australia has, quote, better health care, end quote, better health care system than the United States. That's what Donald Trump said. So my Republican friends here who support President Trump, listen to what he said. Because on this one instance, he's not right very often. But I will confess that on this issue, he is right. In Australia, everyone is guaranteed health care is a right. Australia has a universal health care program called, ironically, Medicare that provides all Australians with affordable, accessible, and high-quality health care. While the United States has the most expensive, bureaucratic, wasteful, and ineffective health care system in the world, Australia, it turns out, has one of the most efficient. President Trump was right. In 2014, Australia's health care system ranked sixth out of 55 countries in efficiency. The United States ranked 44th. Not only does Australia guarantee universal health coverage, it spends less than half what we spend on health care per capita. In 2015, they spent $4,500, while we spend almost $10,000. While the Australian government spent 9% of its GDP on health care, the United States spent nearly double that, 17%. Further, Mr. President, many health care services are far cheaper in Australia. An MRI costs about $350 in Australia versus $1,100 in the United States. One day in a hospital costs about $1,300 in Australia versus $4,300 in the United States. An appendectomy costs about $5,200 in Australia versus roughly $14,000 in the United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not only does Australia guarantee universal health care, spend less on health care per capita, and pay less than we do for many health services, they have better health outcomes. In 2014, the average life expectancy in Australia was 82.4 years compared to 78.8 years in the United States. They live longer in Australia. For context, according to a 2014 report, from the World Health Organization, Australian men have the third longest life expectancy and Australian women have the seventh longest life expectancy in the world. The United States doesn't even cra crack the top ten for life expectancy, despite spending so much more than any other country on health care. Mr. President, what all of this comes down to is the fact that we in America are the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And the question that we have got to ask ourselves, and I hope that Senator Daines will address that question as he introduces his Medicare for All bill, 
is how does it happen that in Canada, every man, woman, and child is guaranteed health care? The same is true in the UK, in Germany, France, Australia, Japan, and every other major country on earth. How does it happen that every industrialized country understands that health care is a right of all people because all of us get sick, all of us have accidents, not just the rich? How come every major country on earth says health care is a right except the United States? How come today we have 28 million without any health insurance, more who have high deductibles and high co-payments who are underinsured, and the response of our Republican friends is to say, 28 million uninsured, that's not enough. Let's throw another 22 million people off of health insurance. Our response should be to move forward and guarantee health care to all people, not throw another 22 million people off of health insurance. Now, I don't have the time to go into great detail as to why our wasteful and bureaucratic health care system ends up spending almost twice as much per capita as systems around the world. That is a subject for a lot of discussion, and I intend to play an active role in that discussion. But let me just say this, give you some examples, just a few examples. Because we have such a bureaucratic and complicated system, because hospitals in America have got to deal with this person who has a $5,000 deductible, that person who has an $8,000 deductible, this person who has this, that person has that, they have to deal with dozens and dozens of different configurations for insurance it requires an enormous amount of time, energy, and manpower to deal with those myriad of insurance companies. So the result of that is that the United States spends far more on hospital administrative costs than most other countries. These costs accounted for a quarter of total U.S. hospital spending in 2010, to 2011, more than 200 billion, over twice what was spent in Canada and in Scotland. What I would hope, if we don't sit around just worrying about the profits of the insurance companies, what I would hope that all of us would agree is that when we spend a dollar on health care, we want that dollar to go to doctors, to nurses, to medicine. We want that dollar to go to the provision of health care not to advertising, not to profiteering, not to dividends, not to outlandish CEO insurance company salaries, but to the actual provision of health care which keeps us well. And yet we do that worse than any other major country on earth. Mr. President, the, Madam President, the large health insurance and drug companies are making hundreds of billions of dollars in profits every single year, and they are rewarding their executives with outrageous compensation packages. Once again, the function of health care, to my mind, is to provide quality care to all in a cost-effective way, not to make CEOs of insurance companies and drug companies even richer than they are today. In 2015, the top five health insurance companies made $24 billion in profits. Should the function of health care in America be to allow insurance companies to make huge profits, or should we make sure that all of our people get quality health care? And not only, not only do the insurance companies make huge profits, but their CEOs make outlandish salaries. Well, 28 million Americans have no health insurance at all, and others have very high deductibles. 2015, Madam President, Aetna's CEO made $17.2 million in compensation. Now, Aetna, like every other insurance company, spends half their life trying to 
tell people that they're not covered for what they thought they were covered, but they do manage to find $17 million in salary compensation for their CEO. Cigna's CEO made $17.3 million in compensation. United Health Group's CEO made $14.5 million in compensation. Anthem WellPoint CEO made $13.6 million. And Humana's CEO made $10.3 million. Is the function of health care in America to make CEOs of insurance companies outlandishly wealthy, or is it to provide health care to all people? But it is not just the insurance companies. If you ask people in my state of Vermont what their major concern is, and I think they would say the same in Iowa, probably any state in America, they would say we're sick and tired of being ripped off by the drug companies. We go into our pharmacy, had a medicine I've been using for 10 years, suddenly the price doubled, tripled, for no particular reason other than the pharmaceutical industry could get away with it. Because, Madam President, we are the only major country on earth not to control the prices of the pharmaceutical industry. The result is, and this is an outrage and speaks to everything that should be discussed, but which is not being discussed in the Republican bill, is that today one out of five patients under the age of 65 who gets a prescription from their doctor is unable to afford that prescription. Now, how crazy is that? What kind of dysfunctional health care system allows somebody to go to a doctor because they're sick, doctor writes a prescription, one out of five Americans can't even afford to fill that prescription. What happens to that person? Well, likelihood is they get even sicker. Then they end up in the emergency room at outrageous cost. Maybe even worse, they end up in the hospital. How crazy is that? I have not heard one word, not one word from my Republicans, about addressing the absurdity of Americans paying by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. And I got a chart over here, just deals with a half a dozen drugs, but we can list many, many more. Lantus, a diabetes drug, cost $186 in the United States. Diabetes, a very, very serious problem. 186 bucks in the United States. $47 in France, same drug. This is a health care reform debate. I have yet to hear one Republican raise that issue, Madam President. But I think the people in Iowa and the people in Vermont want us to raise that issue. Crestor, a popular drug for high cholesterol, costs $86 in the United States. 86 bucks, $29 in Japan. Advair, used to treat ad as Asthma, another very serious problem, costs 155 bucks in our country, $38 in Germany, and the list goes on and on and on. And that's why millions of people, by the way, are now buying their medicine in Canada and other countries, because they are sick and tired of being ripped off by the pharmaceutical industry, an industry that spends billions of dollars over a period of time on lobbyists here, campaign contributions. You might think, just might, that when we deal about health care reform, one Republican, just one, might stand up and say, well, you know, maybe we might want to stand with the elderly and the sick in this country and not just with the pharmaceutical injury. I have not heard that one Republican in this debate talk about that issue. To give you an example of the greed of the pharmaceutical industry. And I can go on and on. They are the greediest, maybe with the exception of Wall Street. It's hard to determine which one of these institutions are more greedy. But the pharmaceutical industry certainly can make a claim to being the greediest industry in this country. Out in California, a few months ago, there was an effort to lower the cost of prescription drugs in their state. It's called Proposition 61. The big drug companies spent $131 million to defeat that ballot initiative. $131 million to defeat a ballot initiative in California that would have lowered the cost of prescription drugs. And all over this country, the American people cannot afford the medicine that they need, but the drug companies had $131 million to spend just on one initiative. Meanwhile, while the American people 
are getting sicker and sicker and sometimes dying because they cannot afford the medications they need. I have received, and I think every member of the Senate has received communications from oncologists, people who are dealing with patients who have cancer, who are saying, my patients cannot afford the high cost of cancer medicine, and it's not just cancer, of course. But while the American people are getting ripped off by the drug companies, the five largest drug companies in America in 2015 made over $50 billion in profits. Five companies, $50 billion in profits, and yet one-fifth of the American people cannot afford to buy the prescriptions they need. How outrageous is that? And my Republican colleagues are telling us they're dealing with health care reform without mentioning one word about the high cost of prescription drugs. Give me a break. You're dealing with many things, but you're not dealing with health care reform. But again, it's not just the in pharmaceutical companies that are making huge profits. You are seeing executives from these large drug companies making outrageous compensation. In fact, in 2015, the top 10 pharmaceutical industry CEOs made $327 million in total compensation. Elderly people walk into the drugstore, can't afford the prescription drugs they need, and yet you had CEOs of major drug companies making $327 million in total compensation. Former CEO of Gilead, John Martin, became a billionaire because his drug company charged $1,000 a pill for Sovaldi, a hepatitis C drug that costs $1 to manufacture and can be bought in India today for just $4. And this country sold for a $1,000 a pill. And he became a billionaire as a result of it. That is a health care system out of control. And again, our job, I know it's a radical idea here in the United States Senate, but maybe, just maybe, we might want to represent the American people and not the CEOs of the drug companies and the insurance companies. Mr. President, Madam President, some of my Republican colleagues have been spending the last few days using words like freedom, choice, and opportunity to try to convince the American people about their abysmal health care legislation. This is the same language that right-wing ideologues like the billionaire Koch brothers use when they try to discredit government programs and move to privatize them. What the Koch brothers mean by freedom is their own freedom. And by the way, they are the second wealthiest family in America worth some $80 billion. What they mean by freedom is their own freedom to profit off the misery of ordinary Americans who rely on a wide variety of government programs that make life bearable and in some cases even possible. Now, I want to say a word about freedom. Madam President, this is a 203-foot yacht. This is a yacht owned by a billionaire that costs about $90 million to purchase. Now, like everybody else, I think, in this chamber, I think the American people, every American, should have the freedom to purchase this $90 million yacht. And I would urge all Americans, go to the Internet, find out where the yacht stores are, whatever they sell yachts, and you go out there and you say, hey, I got the freedom to buy this $90 million yacht. We all believe in that. You got the money, you buy it. Madam President, here is a picture of a collapsing home. 
And this home is worth tens and tens of millions of dollars. Looks to me like it has 30 or 40 or 50 rooms, probably a few, I don't know, five, 10 bathrooms. It's a really nice house. And uh, it is owned by a billionaire. And, you know, I think every American who wants to own a home worth tens and tens of millions of dollars, go to your local realtor, you go out and you buy that home. But, Madam President, what we are talking about today in terms of freedom is not freedom to buy a yacht or freedom to buy a mansion. We are talking about the freedom to stay alive, the freedom to be able to go to the doctor when you are sick, the freedom not to go bankrupt if you end up in the hospital with a serious disease. So when my Republican friends talk about freedom of choice, fine, we all agree. You got the money, you go out and buy any big house you want, buy any big yacht you want. But where there is a serious disagreement is we say that the children of this country who have serious illnesses have the freedom to stay alive even if their parents do not have a lot of money. That older people who are now in nursing homes should have the freedom to get dignified care in a nursing home, even if they have Alzheimer's and even if they don't have a lot of money. Health care is not another commodity. Health care is not a mansion. Health care is not a yacht. Health care is whether we stay alive or whether we don't, whether we ease our suffering or whether we don't. And I believe, unlike, unfortunately, many of my Republicans, that that right to get health care when you need it is something that every American should be able to get. Here in the Senate, we have good health insurance. And over the last 10 years, a number of senators have had serious illnesses. They have gotten some of the best care in the world. If it's good for the United States Senate, it is good for every American. Health care must be a right of all people not a privilege. Quality care must be available to all, not just the wealthy. So Mr. Daines is going to come down here in a while, Senator Daines, to offer a Medicare for all proposal. And again, I hope that this is a breakthrough. I hope that our Republican colleagues understand that we have got to join the rest of the industrialized world. And if Senator Daines comes down here, and is prepared to vote for that legislation, prepared to get his other Republican senators prepared to vote for that legislation, my God, we can win this vote overwhelmingly and move this country in a very different direction. But Madam President, I have a feeling that that is not what Senator Daines has in mind. I think this is another joke, another game, another sham in part of, as part of a horrendous overall process. So I will not be supporting that amendment unless Senator Daines and Republicans votes for it as well. But this I will do. Whether in this debate, and I hope I have the opportunity, or in the very near future, I will offer, I will offer a Medicare for all single payer program, which finally has the United States doing what every other major country on earth does guarantee health care to every man, woman, and child in a cost-effective way. And when we do that, and when we eliminate the need for families to spend fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year for health insurance, we will save the average middle-class family substantial sums of money.